Hello Year 9, I hope you're all well. Just going to go through this quickly then, talking you through today's lesson which is available on Show My Homework. I found that sometimes it's good for students to be able to hear a friendly voice and uh, to have somebody talk through exactly what you're expected to do for each of the activities. So that's what I'm going to be doing here. So my advice is to have this video and then have the work going and then pause after each activity so you can hear me explain it rather than just watch this or not watch this properly and then uh, to sort of get to the end. So. Stop the video at key points, which I'll tell you, and I'll go through uh, this with you because there are some bits in this lesson which actually you need to listen to this video in order to be able to do them. So with that in mind then, uh, this is activity number one. This one should take you about 10 minutes, so make sure you can see a, a clock or see the time somewhere and be ready. As it says at the top, there's going to be some unfamiliar vocabulary in today's lesson. It's an unseen poem, so remember what we've said. Unseen poetry is something that you will have to, uh, to write about in your GCSEs which is why we're starting to practice it now in year nine. So it's not about learning poems, it's about learning the skills of how you approach a poem and any text as well. It's not just about poetry, but for this unit, we call it Unseen Poetry. Use a dictionary to find and write down the definitions for the following words. Um, as I put in brackets there for limbo, there's a couple of definitions. I want you to write down both. The words are pronounced purgatory, oppression, manacles, which doesn't actually come up directly in today's poem, but will be useful in the next few weeks as well. Cat of nine tails, not 100% sure I've got the spelling exactly right, but again, if you use the internet, you'll find it pretty quickly. And the word relentless. So you need to pause this video now. I'm gonna go quiet for a few seconds just to let you do that. Take yourself 10 minutes writing down those words, okay? Pause me now, please. Right, presuming you've had a go at that first activity then, make sure you've got all these notes nice and neat because you'll be submitting a picture to show my homework later. Okay, have a look at the picture I'm about to show you. Decide, do you know what this represents? And also, have you got any prior knowledge of this topic? Because you will possibly have covered it. I know from past experience, students often cover this in history. So what is going on in that picture? Just take a few seconds to look at the details there. If I tell you that this is an aerial view, almost drawn from above, think about the shape that you've got there. Now, a number of you will have understood or recognised this, perhaps, that this is the a sort of a, a an aerial shot, an aerial sort of drawing, sorry, of a slave ship. All of those black uh, figures that you see there are representing slaves on this slave ship, and they are all literally packed in almost like cargo. Now this is sometimes something that's very difficult for students to get their head around, but just the cruelty involved in the slave trade and the idea of transporting human beings against their will, capturing them and then taking them to a different country where they will be sold. So you are you're almost just making huge amounts of money very easily. I can't talk about it for too much longer, but it's a, a horrifying image when you think about every one of those as an actual human being who's had their life uh, taken away from their freedom taken away from them. Um, what I'm going to do is say there, the context is important as it helps us bring knowledge and ideas to a text. So that is very true for this poem. I'm about to run through some information about slavery in the next few slides. You need to listen to me as I'm talking. You can pause this video as you go, of course, but make your own bullet points notes, please. That's, again, part of the task, which is why it's task two there, making notes. Now, uh, you could also research the words slave triangle and get some notes as well about this. So, again, get ready to bullet point, get ready to pause, and here we go. Oh, ignore that. Right, so the slave trade then. So we're talking about between 18, 1540 sorry, and 1850, it's estimated that around 15 million men, women and children as well were captured in Africa and then uh, boarded onto the ships, much like the one we just saw from above there, and taken in ships over to America and also the West Indies, which is where the slave triangle thing comes on, like a three point uh, journey. So they start in Africa, they go over to the Americas, including the Caribbean, where they would swap their cargo of human beings for spices and cotton, and then they would uh, take that over to Britain and unload that there, and then their empty ship they would take back down to Africa and repeat it again and again, making themselves huge amounts of money. So trading humans for products, taking those products to Britain, and then again going and picking up more slaves and off you go again. Um, I forgot about these transitions. So on the ships then, the, the, the conditions can, are hard to describe and actually put into words. They are truly appalling and abhorrent. Uh, sometimes they're expected to row these ships as well. It depended on the type of ship. If they disobeyed, they would be struck with whips or sticks, beaten, sometimes to death, 
bodies would just be chucked over into the sea if there were any. It, the, yeah, again, I can't put into words. It's absolutely hideous and like being chained to these iron bars. And the conditions as well, you're crossing the Atlantic. This is really, really hot, horrible conditions. And they were stuck in cramped, uh, cramped sort of holds beneath the boats and so forth. Horrible. Uh, moving on. And as I was just touching on, really, the conditions about how extremely poor they were. Many slaves died during the crossing. It was in the interests of the slave traders to try and keep them alive because more human beings equals more money. So they certainly didn't want to kill any of these men and women and children or have them die. But at the same token, they uh, they were not pleasant to them as well. They would feed them the bare minimum. They would try and keep them down in the hold most of the time. They had to get them out occasionally to have exercise in order that they didn't all die. But yeah, don't get me wrong, huge numbers of people would even die on the crossing as well. Um, just going to make a quick recommendation while we're on this topic as well. For any of you who are interested, there's a film which is a slightly higher age rating, so you'd need to check with parents, but it's a fantastic film called 12 Years a Slave. I think it was doing the rounds on either Netflix or Prime not that long ago. Uh, alternatively, the book that that film is based on is truly brilliant as well. It's If you search for Solomon Northup, uh, and it is available free online, this book as well, because it's, it's that old. Um, it's a true story of a man who was captured in the northern states of America where black people were free and transported and sold into slavery. And he was in slavery for 12 years. He couldn't escape and he eventually did. And it's his diary, his true recounting of his story. It's, it's phenomenal. And that is what the film is based on. So just one more thing then. When they arrived, these people on the ships then, these slaves, when they arrived, uh, they were sold to work on plantations. So growing huge numbers of crops where they would be doing all the manual labor, which meant that the people who owned these plantations uh, made huge amounts of money because they didn't have to pay their workforce. They bought them and then they were slaves forevermore. And the children who were born from those slaves would stay in the slavery, in the uh, ownership of these people. It was a horrible, horrible part of human history. Britons were some of the first to abolish slavery, but by no means are our hands clean, to use an expression. Um, yeah, these people were auctioned, as you see what's going on in the picture there. So they're actually being sort of bidded for by people who would look at them, treat them like animals, like look at them to see, are they strong? Are they muscular? Are they tall? Are they going to be good at work in my plantation? These are human beings who had had their lives taken away from them. So limbo, again, still part of your notes here. Meaning number one with limbo then. So we've got a few things going on there. A rhythmic dance where you have to actually bend beneath the pole, like by bending backwards and so not just like crawling under it. It's about going back with a straight back as straight as you can. Uh, it's thought that it was invented by slaves on the ships as well, like the bars that they're going under almost linked to the iron bars that they were chained to. Um, and as it says there, trying to keep themselves fit and supple when you're trapped in these horrible conditions. But there is a second meaning to limbo here as well, which is really important before we read the poem. And it says there, according to the old beliefs, a place between heaven and hell. That's that word purgatory that you would have looked up a little bit earlier for me. And of course, as Christian beliefs say, a place where unbaptized children uh, ended up when they died, which is quite a dark thing as well. But also limbo, to be in limbo is a state of waiting for something to happen. And that again applies to these people on the ship in the poem that we're about to read. So it is now time to read through your copy of the poem. I'm referring to the booklet that you have been sent um, in the post. It's a sort of paper booklet. I'm looking at mine now. It says protest poetry, unseen poetry on the front. And limbo is the first one inside. You're going to want to grab a highlighter because I want you to have a go for 10 minutes now, pausing this video at one, two, three there. As you're reading it, highlight any words or phrases which leap out at you, which seem important. Secondly, once you've read it through, label any methods that you spot being used. And finally, if you could label the effect of anything that you've highlighted, that would be brilliant, or at least choosing two or three things. And as I've said there, try and explain briefly like the mood or the tone or the feeling that's created by, let's say, I don't know, the repetition which happens throughout the poem. So I'm going to go quiet for five seconds now, which should allow you time to pause this video and have a read through of that poem. Over to you. OK, moving on then. So you've had a go at that. That's really important. Now, I'm not going to read through these. This is the next activity quickly for you, please. So again, read those questions. You've got four questions there. Retrieval, inference, summarising and explaining, which are part of your core Vipers cave skills. So again, have a go at those questions for me, please. And pause the video for five seconds now. OK, so thank you for having a go. Again, your teacher, me, will look through all of these. 
Now, it's time to write a response. Now, this is where it gets really important because this is as close as it comes to the GCSEs and I'm going to help you with this next. But have a look at that question on the screen there and in a moment, you can even start doing it while I'm talking, writing down that question onto your page, please. In Limbo, how does the poet present the experiences of slavery? Keywords for you there. How does the poet uh, present it? So how is what methods does the poem, excuse me, the poet use to present the experiences? And then... The experiences of slavery is the key focus of this question. So that poem is all about slavery. It's about being stuck on the ship. And you've got that real sort of feeling of repetition going on there, maybe being stuck. So listen through as I help you with this. Because on my next slide, I've written you an example, which is what I want you to have a go at now for 20 minutes. So it's the question which is down at the bottom there, which you can copy. But if you look on the right hand side there, I've got a one, two, three, four for you to follow, which is actually in brackets there, the P-E-A-R, which you've experienced in class before. It's really important that we try and get this structure into our heads. So I've colour coded my example answer on the left, which I'll read for you in a second. But you can follow that example answer on the left, but adapt it for your own paragraph. You could use the same sentence starters if you're really stuck, but some of you will be able to read that and then sort of absorb it and then create your own paragraph in the same style without copying. But if you're stuck, feel free to use my sentence starters. So I'll read through it. My point is... Uh, remember the question firstly, the experiences of slavery and how that's shown. The poet is called someone Braithwaite, so that's why I've started with their surname. Braithwaite illustrates to us the terrible experiences of being on board a slave ship on a crossing to Africa and the suffering and the cruelty that they must have experienced. One way that they illustrate this is by using language linked to violence. So there's my method, language linked to violence, such as stick, hit, darkness and whip. By, and here comes my analysis. Notes I've just done little quotes there. The shorter the quotes, the better. By using these words, Braithwaite suggests that this is a desperate place, as these words all have negative connotations, because it makes us think of pain and cruelty towards these people. Because the noun darkness, now I'm going into a bit more depth about one word here, because the noun darkness could be interpreted as the literal darkness inside the ship, or the darkness linked to the lack of hope for these people taken into slavery, the poet creates a real melancholy and oppressive tone. And finally, this is though the red and the purple are the most important steps, of course, P-E-A-R, because it really shows your understanding. So here I'm looking at what we're being taught. Braithwaite reveals to the reader just how unpleasant and distressing the experiences of these people must have been and also the terrible suffering that they would have gone through. So it's what I've learned by reading this poem. So there you go, Year 9. That's what I want you to have a go at. So all of the activities you've done so far, including the highlighting, the labelling and the Vipers questions, all of those are designed to try and build you up towards uh, answering a question like this. So give it a good go. My advice to you would be, Focus on the repetition and talk about the repetition in the poem and why that repetition is used. You can't really quote repetition, so when it comes to number two, that green step, you can just say something like, um, we hear the repetition of words like something and something, and that'll do nicely. Okay, so thanks very much for your attention all the way through. Don't forget to check out, I've put when our next live lesson will be, so I'll see you for that live lesson uh, in the meantime. Uh, I hope you stay safe and all the best.